Right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, waiting from technology. Anyway, thank you for uh, coming and uh, for climbing all of the stairs, finding your way here, and uh, for coming here in spite of, of Ted Dunning talking downstairs. He's an excellent speaker, so make sure to watch his video later. Are we good to go? Can you hear me? Well, splendid. You already heard my name. Um, as uh, most speakers here, I've done a bunch of things, and uh, working with data has been one of the themes of my career. From like 20 years ago when I did my master's thesis at the Supercomputing Center in Stockholm, working with scary things like MPI and Cray vector machines. Uh, that was big data at the time. Um, Many of the things uh, that I uh, have learned during these years, I've picked up working at Spotify with data infrastructure and data modeling uh, in their Hadoop-based environment. And their Hadoop cluster actually turns 10 this year, which is a scary thought. That was like bleeding edge not long ago. And nowadays I work as an independent consultant helping companies uh, get value out of data. And um, I'm interested in privacy, uh, it's, it's sort of a passion of mine, and uh, my clients are also interested in privacy because they need to comply with GDPR and other requirements. So I went scouting for resources on the web, and uh, the resources that I could find were like falling into two categories, either are very problem-oriented, the legal aspect, here's everything that you might go wrong, and you might get a large fine if you don't get it right. or uh, like someone selling a product to me, like put all of your data into our system and everything will be much better. What I failed to find was like engineering oriented resources, how to actually go about protecting uh, users' privacy without sacrificing all of the goodies that we have. Uh, so I decided to try to give that talk myself. Uh, but we, you'll get only bits and pieces, so please, if you have things to contribute in this area, you know, see this as an inspiration of, of, of uh, telling the world. Um, there are a lot of angles uh, that you have to cover and, um, if you want to protect users' privacy and that you have to work on. Um, so, and I will focus on the bottom ones here, architecture and culture. Uh, most of the talk will be technical. There will also be some like bottom-up uh, culture awareness for engineers. Uh, I will only give you tools, patterns, not a whole system that will solve everything for you. So you have to take the pieces and, and uh, assemble them as you see fit. It's kind of like an, an IKEA, piece of IKEA furniture. You have to do the last work yourself. And I will assume that you have other ways to solve the other aspects. For example, that you have security primitives in place to, to like limit access and so forth. So I will not touch these subjects. And I believe that the reason I'm here no, and nobody else is that I'm independent. If somebody comes from a company and speak about privacy, the first question they get is, so what is like at your company? And nobody wants that question. Um, so, but the, I've been at enough places to cast like reasonable doubt. So what I'm saying today does not describe practices at any specific company. Uh, there are bits and pieces that I've picked up during my, uh, during my journey, both from Companies solving things the good way, and company making, companies making mistakes. So, from an engineer, architect, or developer perspective, there are some things that you need to be prepared for. And um, I'm going to spend a lot, most of the time on the top one, the ability to delete users and forget their information, because that's, that's a tricky one. But there are a number of other things uh, that you also need to care about, like uh, limiting the access that employees have to data and limiting the access that uh, any hackers that intrude on your system might have to data and so forth. Uh, and you, there are also upcoming requirements of uh, uh, being able to export all of the users' data and so forth. I will touch a bit of those, but most of the time will be spent on the right to be forgotten. So to set some context here, if you go back in time to our first like, web applications, things were simple. There was a monolith and there was a database. 
And all of the state of the users were generally stored in that database. Um, so if you get a request from a user and say, can you please delete uh, all the information that you have on me and remove me, and, or what data have you got on me, that was a fairly simple thing to uh, comply with. And uh, if you re even if today you read like a text written by people that do not understand how data processing systems work today, this seems to be sometimes seems to be an assumption. Uh, so this is like a cultural bridge that you may have to gap. Today we don't work this way. Uh, since the uh, comment of Hadoop, we now have the power, uh, both economic and technical, to store everything that has ever happened. And we do so, because it gives us the power to uh, go back and build new uh, pipelines to get more data. And we organize things in, in, a, uh, in pipelines that refine this raw data, and data is copied in these pipelines and so forth. We do this for good reasons. Uh, this, in comparison to the sort of database-centric uh, world that we used to live in, enables us to do much more complex things. Uh, it enables us to uh, be uh, tolerant to human error. We can, it's easy to fix bugs on, on, on the data processing side by reprocessing and so forth. So we are not going to give this up and go back to a sort of mutable database world because this, this is one of the factors that sort of separate the, the wheat companies from the chaff companies. So we have to find a way in such an environment to, uh, to be able to delete users anyway. If you scale this up, this is roughly what a uh, data processing system today looks like in the companies that I work with. Uh, you collect either events on the left side or dump databases, and you pour them all into uh, something that goes by the buzzword data lake. This is, this is the buzzwords conference. I'm happy to use uh, buzzwords without shame. Uh, you can also call it cold store or raw store. Um, that raw uh, cold store you never change, typically, unless privacy comes along. But for technical reasons, you prefer not to change it. And then you have uh, pipelines refining that data, combining it, and, and then produce like refined artifacts on the right side, for example, recommendation indexes and so forth. Now I need your help here. Uh, how many people uh, recognize this as a fair description of the kind of systems they work with or would like to work with? Okay, good, most of the audience, good. Because the, the, what I'm saying is relevant for this context, but not for other contexts. One key component here, which we'll get back to a few times, is uh, workflow manager. And that is the, uh, the sort of glue tool that holds your pipelines together and knows about the dependencies and, and helps you uh, like backfill when something goes wrong and helps you uh, build a stable system out of fragile components. And uh, a lot of companies today tend to use the Luigi or Airflow, where you have a, a Python-based DSL for expressing the DAGs, uh, and you have a r fairly rich uh, way to express your, your DAGs. Now, how many in, in here use either Luigi or Airflow or something similar? Just a few. OK, and then that will be my first advice of the day. If you're using something that is more primitive, like, like Uzi or Bash scripts or whatever, uh, you will have a difficult time uh, solving the or following the recommendations that I give up here. So the, the, I, I really would like um, to recommend you to go with a more competent uh, workflow manager. You might have completely different solutions that I'm not aware of, though. In that case, I would like to love to hear about them afterwards. So um, the. There are some patterns that we fall into in order to make these fairly complex, complex systems work and be stable in production. Uh, we tend to favor immutability. When we, we create data sets, we try not to touch them ever after. And uh, we have systems that are with at least one semantics and redundancy and do things more times rather than uh, too few times and so forth. And uh, we architect these uh, dependency graphs uh, by making copies of the data everywhere in order to have reproducible systems. It's, uh, re it's actually fairly common to have thousands of copies, for example, of your entire user database, which, of course, makes it more difficult to delete your users. So in a system where these 
uh, like philosophies are applied. The, qu the request, please delete everything that you have on me, or please enumerate everything that you have on me, can be really difficult to, to answer. So I have a couple of, of solution ideas to present to you. They fo some, are some are purely technical, making it technically at feasible and sort of economically feasible to actually comply with a request for deletion. And some are, are purely on the cultural side, making developers aware. And then there are some in between where the, you can architect the technology to, to sort of push uh, developers to do the right thing. We'll start on the cultural side. Uh, I recommend that the, the, one of the first things that you do is to uh, classify the data that you have. Uh, and I, I, the um, GDPR and other specific legislation speaks about classifications. This is not an example of that classification. This is an example of a classification that you might decide to use in your company. Each company would have a different classification, and you need to make your own decisions here. It is common to classify in three tiers. On the bottom tier, things that are not attached to any people at all. Uh, for convenience, I will give these color names, uh, red, yellow, green. Uh, and the middle classification is information that is not in, uh, particularly sensitive, but might be attached to a person, like names or IP addresses, uh, and so forth. Whereas uh, most companies also handle some uh, sensitive data. Uh, you might think that you don't uh, because you don't handle financial stuff or medical records, but it's actually easy to end up with some real sensitive data anyway if you have like messages in your application or if you have GPS coordinates. Then there will be some stuff that falls into some kind of gray zone that's difficult to classify. And when you process this data, there are some kind of like ar approximate arithmetics that apply. If you take something sensitive and concatenate it with something non-sensitive, then you still have something sensitive. For example, if you put the user some sensitive in a mail message. If you aggregate things, for example, by counting them, non-sensitive, uh, I'm saying usually, it doesn't always apply. But if you have something non-sensitive, enough of it, you can actually draw conclusions from, from that data. So if, if you manage to have enough data on users that can be identified to users, you might actually be able to draw some sensitive conclusions about their, about their, their life behavior and so forth. So these rules are, are, are like not clear. And uh, if you make machine learning models out of uh, sensitive or semi-sensitive data, uh, you in theory, you would hope that the machine learning models generalize so that you uh, end up with something that's non-sensitive. But because of overfitting, it turns out that if you probe these models, you can actually ident often identify uses again. So that's something to be careful with. Also, on the cultural side, I would recommend that you use these classifications and make them, throw them in the face of the developers, make them visible at all times. Uh, for example, in names of data sets, uh, I usually recommend to put them like early in the path of, of your data sets, or in field names, or in wherever names are appropriate. Because this makes the, the developers aware of, of, the, of the, the privacy issues exist and that they're, that they're tampering with, with um, personal data. Uh, it also, if you're consistent, it also enables you to write some, some simple tooling. One of the reasons that I recommend putting the uh, PII levels first in the prefixes is that usually uh, access rights are given on a prefix basis, at least in, in Amazon S3. So there, if you, if you have, for example, have green first, then you know that you can give full access rights to anybody in the company on all the green stuff, and it simplifies your, your access right management. So one other um, cultural thing that we did at the company was to wrap all of this sort of supported data functionality into a single gateway tool. This, this tool is similar to like the AWS command line tool or the G Cloud command line tool, but, but specific for the company. Uh, and then we pushed all of the data scientists and people that work with data to, to use this tool. It, it's, 
this tool had no business logic whatsoever. It, only was, it was only a thin wrapper to other programs, and it had hardwired configuration, so it knew about the production clusters and, and so forth. And they, this gave us a central point of, of like governance where we could do audits and uh, to some degree verifications and also in, uh, enforce like uh, policies that we wanted to have. So for example, if somebody made a temporary cluster to sample, tamper with some temporary data, we could enforce that this cluster with the data was deleted after a while and so forth. This may seem like, uh, like enforcing bureaucracy, but it turned out that the data scientists were really happy with this because it provided them with a directory of all the things you can do. And it also shielded them from the operations, like the details of what names or IP addresses the clusters were at. So they felt really enabled. Um, and it also... Uh, pushed people towards doing the right things. So one thing you don't want people to do is download PII data on their laptops because then you lose control of it. So there was no command for downloading to laptop. There, was, there were commands for creating temporary resources in the cloud instead. Now the data scientists uh, felt so uh, enabled by this that they started spinning up clusters uh, back and forth, and then some manager said, I want these numbers by tomorrow. So after a few weeks, we had somebody who were now in, co in charge of cost control, which I see as a, as a good sign. All right, now towards the technical stuff and uh, forgetting about things. If you have a, a, something like a, a Hadoop cluster, and then a bunch of pipelines, and everybody writes new pipelines, if you drop in a piece of, of um, like personal data somewhere, if you don't focus, this will spread like weed all over your, all over your cluster and out into the, to the uh, online databases that you have for, for serving users and so forth. Uh, so you have to have some kind of plan in order to prevent this from, from happening. And you either need to like, apply some governance, like bureaucracy on the cluster, uh, or to encapsulate data, or to drop data. The best thing from a privacy perspective, of course, to drop data. So you, you start by dropping the data that you don't need. So you can either make your data completely anonymous. For example, if you have... Uh, page views or somebody uh, played a video or whatever, you just drop the, the user ID. And for, if for each record there is no way to get back to the user ID, then the, the uh, data is anonymous. Now, unfortunately, with anonymous data, there's not a lot you can do. You can count things, but not more than that. Uh, you can still make the data anonymous and attach some information if you look up the user and join in with, for example, course demographical information, what, what age, country, gender, and so forth, user. Then the data at the end of the pipeline becomes more useful, for example, for business insights, uh, but you still have completely anonymous records. Uh, but if you add enough data so that some data uh, is uh, actually rare, for example, there are not, in some zip codes, only very few people live. Uh, then you actually no longer have non-anonymized data and you can uh, connect it back to users. If you have really anonymous data, the GDPR states that the, uh, these rules no longer apply, so you don't have to fulfill all of the rules. But I'm not a lawyer. Don't take my advice as, as legal. This is just like for your general information. You will need to go back to your company and solve all of the legal things and get approvals and so forth. So, you can halfway anonymize things. For example, by replacing the user ID with a consistent hash of the user ID. That's the upper example here. Then the, it, all of the records are still li linked back, so you can see that the same user was doing all of these records, but you don't know which user if you just look at one data set. This is called pseudonymization. Uh, there's a misconception here that if you do this, it's called anonymization. It's not. It's called pseudonymization. So don't mix these up because these terms appear in legal text and so forth. So be careful with it. And this is still pre uh, sensitive information because you can trace things back to the user. Perhaps not by looking at one data set, but combine, by combining with other data sets. So all of the rules still apply and so forth. 
Um, like if you make a consistent hash, then you, then you, if you have the user ID later, you can hash that and figure out which users uh, belong to which records. So you can, in a pseudonymized pipeline, like build recommendation indexes, and then in your online service, look up which user is, is which. Um, if you, you can also go like halfway uh, by adding a salt into, the, into your hashing, so that it's no longer reproducible. Uh, who wants me to explain the concept of salting? Okay, good. Um, then it cannot be used for, for things like recommendations, but you still get a feel for the, you can still get an information about the user journey, so you can use it for like uh, product insights and for looking at user sessions and, and, and the travels of users inside your website and so forth. So, um, if, you don't, if you're not discarding data, or in complement to discarding data, you want to forget users, uh, then you will have uh, your, you, your online user database, you remove the, the <coughs> user from the database, and in your Hadoop cluster or S3 or whatever, the dump of the database no longer contains that user. But that user's information has been copied throughout all of the downstream jobs, so you need to do something about that. The sort of simplest brute force uh, solution is to rerun all of your downstream jobs. And in this case, this is the, these are the cases where you might benefit from a, a, a fairly sophisticated workflow manager because that's the tool to help you do reruns and so forth. Unfortunately, they don't go all the way. For example, there, there are no built-in uh, support for, for like versioning and revisions of data sets, so you have to do a bunch of, of work on your own in order to get this to work well. Uh, it's also really computationally expensive, uh, but you can start doing this today without changing your, your data models. So, there are better patterns if you tweak with the data model. For example, you can encapsulate your PII data by not putting it and copying it around in all of your data sets. Instead, you put a, a, like a hash or U, UUID in your data sets, and that refers to some kind of table where the PII information is stored. And then once you remove things from the table, nothing can, uh, no one can access that information anymore. So that's, now you only have one place where you need to remove things in order to uh, drop users' data. Um, the drawback is that you need to join with this table all the time. But from a privacy perspective, this is a lot better. Now, uh, I'm mixing up a, a couple of uh, concepts here. I'm saying tables, which is something that belongs to the database world, and I'm speaking about data sets and so forth. You can have things like the, like the PII uh, table in a, da in a database. Usually, it's a, an anti-pattern to query live databases from, from your pipeline code. Uh, but in this case, it might be a good exception. Uh, you can also um, have data sets that represent this, this lookup table, uh, which is what I would recommend. And in a, in a, usually in a dependency graph or pipeline, if, you, if you're computing an end data set for a particular date, say in this case, in this example, all the purchases for one day, you would uh, construct your, your dependency graph to point on the source data sets for the same day, so the uses for the same day, the orders for the same, and so on. And then you make an exception for these PII uh, tables so that you always depend on the latest one uh, so that you know that whenever you remove something there, uh, it's getting removed. Normally, you would want to have reproducibility, but uh, not in this case. You explicitly want things not to be reproducible because you want to be able to remove users. And this is easily expressible. This, this syntax here is an example from Luigi where this is fairly easy to do. I'm sure you can find examples out there. So this is a variation of the, um, the PII uh, table, where you don't put the actual data in a separate table. Instead, you put in a decryption keys. So you encrypt all of your uh, PII data and copy it around all of the data sets. But in order to decrypt the data for your pipeline processing, you need to go and look up in this PII key table. 
And then when you want to remove a user, you just throw the decryption key out of the table. You still have, all, still have all of the encrypted data out there, but since you lack the key, you cannot use it, and therefore the, the user is protected. Some companies' legal departments might not agree with this. You need to get your approval. I can't vouch for that. But this is actually a super practical pattern. So if you don't know where to start in this, in this uh, journey, this, this might be the slide you want to go back to. You can also use this decryption decryption key to decrypt multiple fields. So that simplifies life for you. So you can, typically you would have a record with lots of, lots of PII data, names, email addresses, and so forth, and you encrypt them, them all with the same record. And then you only have one table where to remove the keys. And if you want to make this more granular, you can have different keys depending on, uh, for different types of data. This gives uh, users the uh, ability to uh, ask for a partial oblivion. Please forget some of my information, but not others. So for, if, for example, users might want you to forget all of their uh, information about their whereabouts, their GPS tracking, which you might be tracking for some reason. But they still maybe want the personalization to work well and all the recommendation indexes, which are not dependent on, on the GPS tracking. There's another variation uh, where you can discard the ability to link, to join between data sets. So in this case, you have uh, two data sets, for example, like activities and users, and you have a key field in these data sets uh, which you use to join the data sets. Now, if you encrypt that key on both sides, and store the encryption key here in the, in the, in the key table. Once you uh, throw away that key, you can no longer uh, join these two events together, which means that if, if one of these data sets holds your activities, uh, if you throw away the key, you can still benefit from the activities, for example, to feed your recommendation engines, uh, but you can no longer figure out which user it was that actually made these actions. In all of the key uh, table uh, patterns that I've shown here, you can also apply uh, salting if you want, at some cases. If you don't salt, you get consistent, uh, uh, you get consistent encryptions, so that you, if, if you don't salt and you're uh, encrypting with a key in your data sets or across data sets, uh, one clear text thing will be uh, encrypted as the same thing, so you can connect things together, which you may or may not want. Whereas if you use salting, uh, you can still do the decryption and get all of the information back, but if you only have the encrypted variant, you can no longer connect things together. Now, in some cases, uh, you have conflicting requirements. For example, you may have legal requirements to never forget anything for, for like financial reasons or for, uh, for uh, crime uh, prevention reasons. And this is in conflict uh, with forgetting users. But there is a trick here that you use the same key table pattern, uh, but when you discard the key, you don't drop it completely. You just drop it from all of your records and you give it to somebody else. This somebody else might be a user, and you can tell the user, here's the key. If you want to make any claims towards us, you need to provide this key. Or it can be some kind of, of uh, external entity that will only uh, give back the key, for example, in, with a court of law order. So this, um, enough about Oblivion. Uh, this is a slide with some mistakes that I've seen made that are very costly, very, very costly. One of them is to use uh, personal data as keys, as now I mean not encryption keys, but as primary keys and joining keys in your data models, because then they're really difficult to throw away. And reworking all of your data uh, from such a state is very expensive. Um, the other mistake that I've seen made is to publish uh, things that actually contain PII data. And you might do this by accident. For example, if, you, if you, your 
uh, users might publish, be able to publish some kind of, of list with compilations or documents or whatever, and that URI contains a username or something. It, that, that's an easy mistake to make. But once you've published things, you cannot forget them. Um, and the third mistake is to publish uh, pseudonymized data sets under the impression that they're somehow anonymous. And uh, there are plenty of examples where, where companies have goofed up here. Uh, the AOL search uh, data set is the most famous. The, uh, you might remember the Netflix um, like recommendation competition. Apparently somebody ma managed to de-pseudonymize that by correlating activities with activities on IMDB and they could figure out who the users were. Uh, so there, there's absolutely no way to be sure uh, if you publish the anonymous data, so, you, so just don't. So another trick. Uh, the previous tricks that I spoke about, they, they uh, work best in the pipeline domain, um, where you have a pool uh, scenario. When you compute things in pipelines, you can go out and pull this data set in or pull the table in. In your online services, they might not do this pool. They might be online all the time. So it's useful to publish a sort of a data set or a stream of all of the users that, that want to be forgotten uh, so that online services can consume this and do whatever they need to do in their uh, serving databases in order to remove users. Um, where you should, from a privacy perspective, it's better to strive towards the pool pattern. So if you can change your, your online services to like rebuild their indices, indices on a regular basis or something, uh, then you're safer in terms of PII. The push pattern is more fragile because it's easy to, to miss and have PII leaks. Now, I'm saying delete, like that's a really simple thing to do. It turns out that it's not because of all of the, our components and all of our abstraction layers, they also have this like immutability and, and redundancy and so forth. Right? And uh, just to take an example, uh, I guess a whole bunch of people here know how roughly how Cassandra works. Uh, you have a bunch of nodes and if you actually want to delete some data in there, you don't go out to the nodes and delete it. You uh, publish the, or Cassandra under the hood, publish as a tombstone record uh, saying that this data is, should no longer be there and then it spreads to all of the nodes and every, everybody's in agreement. Except that the data, actual data is kept for quite a long time until uh, you run something called major compaction where you clean things up. But for some configurations of, of Cassandra, uh, you cannot actually do major compactions and it's common to see installations where they are never done, so data ne never gets deleted. Uh, likewise, if nodes are connected for a while uh, or disconnected for a while, they, they're not aware of this deletion. So the uh, bottom line here is that for every component you use, you need to have component-specific expertise on how to really delete things, and this can be quite tricky. Likewise, for every storage type of storage layer that you use, uh, be it uh, virtual disks or, or storage as a service or whatever, you need to figure out how to actually delete things. So I have a, a couple of pieces of advice here. Uh, keep the number of components down in order to minimize this competence that you need. Keep the number of storage layers down so that there are fewer things that you need to know. If you use cloud storage layers, if I understand the, the, the uh, legal aspects right, you need to go out and get agreements from, from the providers saying that they will comply if you delete things and so on. So that there's a non-technical aspect to it as well. And try to come up with simple strategies. Uh, so if you, for example, uh, if you're, uh, you're in the cloud uh, and use Cassandra, um, you can run your major compactions and then actually cycle the machine so that no machine lives for more than 30 days or 90 days or whatever. And as you cycle the machines, you remove the block storage layer. That's probably going to work out well if you get an agreement with, uh, with your cloud provider. So find some kind of simple strategy like this. Uh, I can also observe that the uh, there is a cost to heterogeneity in general. I mean, e each component that you bring in. This is not so uh, high in a uh, in a, like a microservice world where you have autonomous teams uh, and so forth, because the, the teams can actually be fairly autonomous. In the data processing world, the cost of heterogeneity heterogeneity is much higher 
because the data is naturally more coupled. You pass data all through your organization and through many teams. These, the privacy regulations make increase the cost of heterogeneity even more. You not only need to comply with forgetting users who want to be forgotten, you also need to limit the amount of time that you, um, that you store data. And uh, I would advise you to try to solve this in your workflow manager because that's where data creation is controlled and that's where data destruction uh, also should happen. Uh, make the default a short retention and do an exceptional uh, whitelist of the exceptions rather than the other way around because if, if you do uh, blacklisting, you will miss some things and PII will leak. Now, unfortunately, this retention ideal is, or, or retention requirement is in conflict with the technical ideal that you would like to keep all of the data around or forever in raw form so that you can go back in case you make mistakes and so forth. So, uh, what you can do here is if you have PII, a PII data set that you need to remove because of retention rules, then what you can take is to take the first downstream data sets and sort of promote them to your cold storage, to, to your data lake, and say that we are now regarding this as the raw data. We will no longer be able to reproduce it. Uh, this has the advantage that the, uh, the, all of your workflow management DAGs uh, still work as, as expected. You don't, it's just a sort of a social convention that you no longer are able to, to discard this data. And if you make this first step, uh, kind of washing and cleaning, uh, where you remove the PII data or, or separate the PII data, then you are, are sort of maximizing your ability to, to rerun things later. There is a concept of lineage, uh, which isn't talked a lot about, but it will be uh, needed for the requirements to export all of the data to users and to enumerate all of the data we have, what you have. It's basically tracking data flow as it goes through, the, through your pipeline DAGs. You can either do this on a granularity of data sets, and then your workflow manager is your best friend. There are no ready-made tools for, for it, but it's a good place to implement it or on a granularity of fields. There are some tools out there that do this. I haven't worked with them. Uh, they do this typically by instrumenting like Spark uh, or similar tools. Today, this is done mostly for, for like software engineering reasons, pipeline change uh, management and so forth. Uh, but it's also a useful concept to do when, when, for example, when tracking that personal data is leaking through data sets where it's actually not needed and so forth. And I have a challenge to throw out, uh, out there. Uh, I don't believe that instrumenting the frameworks is a good idea uh, or a good place to solve these things. I think they might be much more useful if you solve them inside the type system. So if, if there are any Scala geeks in the audience, this one's for you. Uh, you could, for example, wrap your data type, standard data types with, and ornament them with, with like uh, PII level information and or history information to trace where the actual data comes from and build tooling around that. I haven't seen any such tools, so this is like a solicitation and provocation to any people out there that might want to hack on this. Contact me if you want. That's it. Uh, I couldn't have done this myself, so there are a bunch of people uh, who deserve credit for helping me with, with the contents of this uh, presentation. Uh, and in case you want more context on, on things like building pipelines and the type of, of structures that I'm assuming, or workflow managers and so forth, there are these links up there. The first one is a presentation I made last year, and the second one is a, like a curated data engineering reading list. Contains a lot of good information. The other two links are the uh, the only material that I could find there from, uh, from like uh, government authorities that w contained some kind of practical information to help you get going with this. I haven't dived too far, but I liked the material that, that I saw. It was solution, more solution than problem oriented. All right, questions?
we have time for uh, one quick question. So. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I never saw any of these patterns applied in practice, but I have a question on one of those you presented where you delete the de-encryption key. What if a user uh, wants their, their data uh, to be recorded again, but then its ID is present associated to old data with the old uh, encryption key and the new encryption key? How do you handle that? The closest answer is this, where you might, uh, you might opt to give the user the decryption key in case uh, he, would he or she would like to uh, bring the data out again. Uh, if the user asks to be forgotten and you don't do this, then the per data is permanently gone. There's no way to get it back. Does that answer your question? for the user and the new key that was generated and still associated to the same user. Maybe it's a naive problem, and that's why you don't understand, but... Um. Are you referring to this scenario where you have multiple keys for the user? Even with this, for example, if I drop the key for just one set of fields yeah. and I want to start uh, encrypting again with the new key because the previous one is lost, yeah. how can I differentiate between the old data with the old encryption key and the new data for the same user with the new encryption key. I mean, for some, the, the, the encryption will fail. Is yeah. it enough of a criteria to? I would say so, yes. Okay. The, the decryption fails. Maybe there was an elegant way to do so, but okay. This answers my question. I don't have one for you, sorry. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you, Lars.